Thank you, Angus. Um, I didn't know I had to be entertaining, though. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have prepared differently. All right. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I mean, you guys could have chosen to go enjoy the last hour, two hours of sunlight, but you chose to be here, and I do appreciate that. Now, I read, the, um, I was reading some of your bios a couple of minutes earlier, and man, I mean, you guys are pretty impressive. My bio is like eight lines long. So either it's you guys are too impressive or it's me that just didn't write enough material. So the both are possible, I guess. Uh, but it's really a huge honor to be here again. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I got, I got to admit something to you guys. When I got the email to, you know, to come and present here, uh, I, I thought it was fake, to be honest. I, I, no, I, seriously, I thought it was a joke. I thought it was a trap by someone who wanted to trick me because I do have some enemies online, believe it or not. So I thought they wanted to trick me into doing something I didn't want. And um, well, I, I almost didn't click on the email and respond. But uh, eventually I did and now I'm here. So everything uh, everything's going good. So a couple of learning objectives for tonight. Very, very simple. Very simple what we're trying to do. First, we'll try to fight jet lag because you guys are very tired, obviously. And I'm not because I've been here for a day and I'm all rested. And that's why I'm on stage right now, I think. Second thing, we'll, we need to kill time until dinner, right? Because, <laughs> I mean, dinner's in 45 minutes, so we have to do something in the meantime, whether you like it or not. Uh, listen to a weird guy talk about his online comics. Well, I'm the weird guy, and I do indeed create online comics. That's what I do for a living. Uh, eventually link up everything with vaccination, because that's why we're here for, right? And finally, possibly leave with an amazing idea, which will be an idea of your own. What, not m one of my ideas. I'll, I'll show you some of my ideas. But I hope that at some point it will spark something in your own mind where you'll be, well, I got to do this when I come back home. And if I can manage to do that with just one or two of you in the room, then my own personal objectives will be met. Here's a quick game plan. I'll tell you about who I am and what I do, because I can hear some of you going like, who's this guy? And that's fine, I'm, I, I'm fine with that. I'll tell you about how great topics are made in my own personal opinion. Uh, we'll talk about the vaccines debate and I'll tell you why I put that in under quot uh, quotation marks. And some lessons that I learned throughout my experience, both, I mean, as a pharmacist, as a media person, as a public speaker, whatever. So a quick word about who I am and what I do, because most of you, if not all of you, have no idea of who I am. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I come from Canada. Canada, big country, beautiful country. I come more precisely from uh, actually Quebec, Montreal, Quebec, the heart of French-speaking Canada. And uh, we're very lucky. I mean, we're a privileged country. We're, you know, we have high quality of life. We're pretty rich. And uh, obviously, I, I, I can't relate to what's going on in some other countries. Uh, but I mean, we complain a lot. We're, we're complainers in Canada, I think. Um, I think it's fair to say that in the US, it's kind of the same. I don't know about Europe, though. So you guys tell me later on. I'm interested to know about that. Oh, yeah, really? OK. <laughs> Apparently. Well. Uh, I'm a pharmacist by training. I've been a pharmacist for 10 years now. Uh, but I was never able to do it full time because I get bored very quickly. Uh, so I did it for a couple, maybe uh, I think a year, not even a year, and then I got bored. And I went to do a, a, a master's degree actually in research. Uh, so I worked in a lab for I think four years uh, in pharmacogenetics, like the farthest you can be from pharmacy to be honest. And then I got bored, I started a PhD and I was like, I don't want to do that. So then I thought, well, might, might as well go in the industry. So I went in the industry, and that's me right here. <laughs> well, first thing you can see is that the, the company I worked for, we had a very business casual attire <laughs> policy. And I did different things in the industry. Uh, I did very scientific things, and things that were not that scientific. I was even a sales representative for a couple of months, and I was Terrible at it, really. I, was, I think I was the worst sales rep in the universe, to be honest with you guys. But it gave me really a good understanding of the whole life cycle of medication, you know, from research to development to marketing and finally dispensing it to the patient and giving advice on it. And that's pretty cool. Um, but throughout all these years, I had an idea, an idea that was stuck in the back of my mind. Uh, I wanted to do something more. I wanted to leave something to people, something 
scientific and credible yet funny, you know? Uh, something that was accessible to anyone, like a blog or maybe like YouTube videos, something like that. I wanted to tackle health-related myths because I have a fascination for all these weird ideas that people keep in their minds that we know they're inaccurate for years, but they still stay. And finally, possibly draw something, although I, I can't draw. If you put a, a pen in my hand and ask me to draw, I don't know, maybe a dog, it will look like anything but a dog. I'm, I'm serious, I'm, I'm terrible at drawing, but if you put a pen in my hands, I'm actually pretty, uh, not a pen, but a, a computer, I'm pretty good. Uh, the name of my website, it's because that's what happened. I created a website that's called Le Pharmacien. Now, that's a, play, uh, that's a play on words in French. It makes no sense at all in any other language, okay? And the most literal tr um, translation in English would be the pharma dog, although there's no dog involved. So again, it makes no sense, and that's fine. But maybe the subtitle is more revealing, and it's the irreverent pharmacist who brings science to life and death to pseudoscience, which happened to be the title of my presentation. And that's really what I try to do. I try to take very boring, complex ideas about health that nobody cares about and make them somewhat interesting, make them funny, uh, and get people engaged in that. And my website became popular very, very quickly to my very own surprise. Uh, in just two years, I gained like something like over 60,000 followers on Facebook, and that's just in Quebec and part of Europe, so French-speaking Europe, uh, so that's pretty amazing. And I had to learn all of these, you know, all these social networks, I, I, I don't know about them. I've never used them personally. Like, I don't use Facebook, I don't use whatever, you know, Twitter and all that. So, I don't know, I had to, to learn how to use them and it, it just gained traction. In parallel with that, uh, I started getting tons of attention from the media. People just asking me, can you come on this TV show, on this radio show? Can you come in like speaking gigs like TED or whatever and talk about what you do and explain to us, you know, why you do it and also make interventions about things related to health. Like vaccines was one of them. I became some of like the go-to guy regarding vaccine, which to me is astounding because I'm far from an, ex from an expert in vaccines. But I getting, I'm getting all these requests and I'm just saying, sure, yeah, I'll do it, I'll try. I mean, I'll do my best. And I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm good at it, but I, I, I actually, <laughs> I do my best for sure. And they, they demand more, so I guess I'm not so bad. How great topics are made? Um, I get asked this question all the time. People ask me, how do you come up with these amazing topics so that your website is so popular? And I asked myself this question several times. And you know, being online, being on the internet, having a blog or a website, or even being in the media, for me, it's pretty much like a war zone, you know? It's, you know, everybody's talking at the same time, and there's this huge amount of information coming at you at the same time. Everybody's attacking each other. You know, it's chaos out there, really. And I learned that there's no such thing as a great topic. It's really about having a great angle on any topic, because any topic can be good. You just need to approach it in a slightly different way, a way that people are not maybe used to, or some, something that's kind of unique. So a couple of examples of things I did. Uh, very early in my website, uh, I think that's the second thing ever I published, actually. I wanted to explain the difference between having a cold and the flu, so I said, well, a cold is just something that happens, and you know, it's not so bad. It's just another reason to be in a bad mood and to watch TV at home. Well, the flu, I mean, the flu kills people. It's serious, guys. And, you know, you turn into a zombie and lose an arm, that kind of things. Um, and I even made, like, this sort of small graph where people could go and check their symptoms and, uh, you know, and it would point out either into flu or cold. It was not too serious, but there was a serious basis. I mean, it was, there, was solid, there was solid evidence underneath it. And I got a very overwhelmingly positive response. So I thought, well, maybe there's something there. So maybe I should keep doing this. So I've been known to do like weird things, you know, like making internal organ talk to each other and talk to the owner, uh, making bones dance, and also uh, comparing doctors to Jedi Knights from Star Wars. Uh, but that's not a story. Um, I'm telling a lot of personal experiences too. Uh, two years ago, I had to have a cavity fixed for the first time in my life, I, I'm 33, I was 31, had a cavity fix, and I was, I was, how can I say that? I was so scared, I was terrified at the idea of going to the dentist. 
And I just told a story. I made a comic about it, telling my experience. But I took this opportunity to convey some scientific information throughout. So I just said, well, look, uh, that's how bacteria develops in your mouth. Uh, that's how, why you should floss, because you get this food that's stuck between your teeth, and that's why you get cavities. And I also explained how dentists uh, fix cavities and uh, what's in those fillings. Is it true that there's lead and mercury in those fillings? So basically, it's, it's, just, it's a personal story that I'm telling, but I just take the opportunity to explain some things that people wouldn't care. I mean, people don't care about that stuff, right? They don't want to hear about that, but they want to hear about the guy that's just completely scared on, uh, on the doctor's chair. So um, I think it, there's a lot to do about that, about you know, showing your just human and very normal side, and then taking this opportunity to explain something so people learn and they don't even realize it. And I think that very idea is pretty awesome, you know, learning without learning in a way. Uh, there's also some topics that I don't even know how I feel about them, like the electronic cigarette. You know, you guys know about that, you know, in Canada it's huge right now. And to be honest, like, I don't know what to think about that. I'm kind of torn between two positions. I don't know if I'm for it or against it. I I'm not sure. So I decided to do exactly that. I just made a comic where I showed the two different parts of my brain that were kind of torn between being for it or being, or being more conservative and, you know, wanting it to be more regulated. And the other side was just, come on, come on, man, just enjoy and relax. It's just something that's pretty nice and it makes people stop smoking. And people really respond to that kind of things because think about that for a moment. How many times do you hear healthcare professionals saying, look, I don't know, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm confused myself. It's pretty rare that someone says that. Scientists and healthcare professionals were people who are, I mean, we're paid to know, <laughs> to know what it's all about. So when you do say to people, I don't know, people like that. I think. So I, how I explain the success of my website ultimately is six things, six sim simple things. First, it's authentic. It's me on a web page. I've never done anything that's closer to my own personality, and I think people respond very well to that. Involvement. I'm hugely involved on a website. It's just not throwing out some text or some comic, you know. I'm actually involved. I respond to comments on the website, on Twitter, on Facebook. So it feels kind of like a community. People are not just, you know, take this and deal with that. I'm actually there for them to answer the questions and uh, bring in some precisions if it's required. Uh, the emotional component, I think it's major, and I'll come back to that later on. Uh, people respond to emotions much more than facts or data. And, you know, we're a bunch of scientists here in the room, and we like facts, we like data, but most people don't. So uh, if you can reach the emotions of people, either because it's funny, you know, I, a lot of my comics are funny, but some are sad. I wrote a comic about depression and anxiety that people told me they were crying while reading it, which is w kind of weird when I think about that. But still, I mean, you c if you can reach them on an emotional level or, or it, it, it triggers something personal to them, then you've kind of achieved your goal and then it kind of gives you permission to, you know, tell them about some things. Uh, of course, there's a need for high-quality information online, but it has to be unique. And I do think my website is unique, at least where I come from. There's probably other guys doing the same thing elsewhere, but I don't know about them. Uh, and again, I think it's, it's important that you distinguish yourself so it doesn't look the same, especially with those younger people, you know, the newer generations, which I'm part of, unfortunately. I'm kind of like the beginning of the Y generation, but they don't care about like 3,000 word texts. They want to read something that resembles them. And finally, effort. I, I put so many hours on that, and I'm not paid. I don't get any money from my website, but it's just something I enjoy, and I feel it's making a difference, and people do say it's making a difference for them, so I just keep doing it until I'm, I go in burnout or something like that. We'll see what happens. All right, so now let's, let's talk about the real stuff, right? Let's talk about vaccines. Now, I mentioned earlier, you know, I put that between quotation marks, and I even put a big X on there, and I'll, I'll tell you a quick anecdote. Um, I was asked last year uh, by a TV show, it was national TV actually, they call me and they say, hey, uh, would you like to take part into this debate about vaccines, li a live debate? And I said, uh, well, what's, what's the debate gonna be about? And they're like, well, we, we will have you, you'll be for vaccines, and we'll have another person who's gonna be against vaccines. And the first question I asked was, 
who's going to be against vaccines? Like, who are you going to find who's going to say that they're against vaccines? And they said, well, there's this lady who, you know, her child uh, had some health issues following a vaccine and all, and she's going to be against, and you'll be for. So I thought about it for about a second, and I said, well, no, I, I'm not going to do that. And they were pretty surprised by my answer because they thought, you know, it's good visibility for my website and all. And my answer was pretty uh, simple. It was, look, there, there is no debate about vaccination. I know there's some people who want to make it look like there's a debate, but there's none. So I can't see myself going on TV and pretending like there's a debate. That's crazy. That would be dishonest not only for me, but that would be dishonest for the people watching too. Um, so they were pretty surprised, but they, I think they dropped the idea of the debate and it never, never occurred actually, which is a good thing, I think. So why did they ask me this? Well, they asked me this, I think, because I made a comic at some point, which was called Five Badly Informed Opinions About Vaccines, which ended up being my most popular comic I ever published, uh, to my own surprise again, uh, because vaccine is not, uh, you know, it's not like a trendy topic or anything, but people seem to respond to that. Uh, very simple comic, very, very simple. What I did is I took five, I took five ideas from uh, my practice or from what I hear in the media or online, just five ideas, not all ideas, but five of them. And I address them in a very simple way. First idea, the flu vaccine causes the flu. The easy answer for that, and any healthcare professional will say that, they'll say, well, it's inaccurate, it's not true, and that's it. Well, it's kind of sad to only say that, you know, to just say it's not true. What I did is I took a different approach. I said, well, look, you're, you're intelligent, right? You're brilliant people, readers. So let's, let's look at vaccines. How do they work? Well, you know, there's live vaccine that have been like uh, sort of put into this uh, device or to, uh, to prevent them from doing damage. There's this dead, uh, dead virus, dead vaccines. There's subunit vaccines that have been cut with a chainsaw or whatever. And there's mock vaccines, you know, fake viruses that, we, that look like real viruses, but they're not. And now th that gave me the opportunity to explain, look, it's not just the fact that the flu vaccine does not cause the flu, but first understand how vaccines work, then understand what are the different types of vaccine. And once you understand that, then you'll be able to get why the flu vaccine does not cause the flu. And I got a, an amazing response for that because people were like, it's the first time someone's trying to explain how vaccines work. It's, and it's crazy that nobody tries to explain that because we think it's too complicated, but it's not. Look at this, it's not complicated at all. Second idea, polio doesn't even exist anymore. Could be, could be another disease, could be measles, could be rubella, whatever. Uh, in Canada, nobody's seen a polio case for, I mean, such a long time. So uh, I think my grandparents know about polio and that's it. So nobody knows what it is and we think it's eradicated and people say, why, why should we vaccinate against polio if it's not there anymore? So I just pointed out to uh, people these, this kind of pattern that we have in our heads, you know, um, and that, you know, the, the, the horrible diseases kill people, so let's vaccinate everyone. And yes, the diseases are almost gone, but what happens afterwards is, why, why do we vaccinate again? Like, the diseases are almost gone, and then, well, no more vaccines. So, and again, people responded very well to that because they, they said, you know, I'm skeptical regarding vaccine, but I got to admit, I do see this pattern in my own head. Um, and that, that was great to see people responding to that. Uh, the safety of vaccines is unknown. I hear that all the time. Uh, people think that vaccines are put on the market about six months after they've been invented which makes no sense whatsoever, but again, that's what people think. Um, and the, the next thought that they have is, if it's put on the market so soon, then it, 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 it can't be safe. So vaccines are not safe. Now, the easy answer for that would be, well, yes, vaccines are safe. You can trust vaccines, but that's not my answer. My answer is, uh, no, that's, you're correct. Vaccines are not safe indeed, because nothing is safe, let's be honest. I mean, what's safe? Like, let's say you're home, you're at home, and then you're just driving your car and going to the clinic to get vaccinated. Now, what kinds of risks do you expose yourself to? Like, you could die in a car crash, you could be hit by a stray bullet or attacked by killer bees or struck by lightning. I mean, there's tons of things that could happen to you, 
And the likeliness of those things happening is not much higher or even lower than, you know, it, it, it's, it, usually it's higher than getting a reaction to the vaccine. So again, I think it comes from the idea that people don't see vaccines as medications. And I, I always come back with this. I say, look, vaccines, they're medications. And taking a medication is never trivial. There's always a risk involved. Now, is the risk higher getting the disease or getting the vaccine? Now, you need to figure that out for yourself. Uh, vaccines cause autism, well, I mean, of, of course I had to explain, you know, the whole Andrew Wakefield study and why it was rejected worldwide and all that. And I introduced another idea which I called the Thiomersal Aluminum Scapegoat, because there are tons of people coming to me at the pharmacy or writing to me on my website and saying, oh, well, you know, Thiomersal is why we shouldn't give vaccines or whatever. And lots of people say, I'm really scared of Thiomersal, and I say, well, do you know what Thiomersal is? And they say, no, I don't know what it is. And I mean, so why are, you scared? why are you scared about that if you don't even know what it is? So basically, they're not scared of Thiomersal. They're scared of the unknown. And that's, that's really how it is. People are scared of what they don't know. Uh, so I explain, you know, what's these adjuvants and what are, why are they used for and et cetera. So it's just, it, these kind of words are just good scapegoats to scare people because they don't know what it is, really. And finally, my kids don't need vaccines because whatever, you know, uh, because they, they take homeopathic vaccines or they take, they're on a gluten-free diet, toxin-free, they boost their immune system with herbal stuff or whatever, I hear that all the time. And again, I just, I just explain to people, look, there's two options. It, it, it's not, it's easy, two options. If you want to get to be immune to a disease, either you get the disease and you survive, or you get the vaccine. Now, there's risks on both sides, right? Not, nothing is, is, is risk-free, but you gotta weigh the risks versus the benefits and see where the risk is higher. And, you know, the risk is, all, is pretty much always higher with getting the disease itself. Like chickenpox. In, in Quebec, we have a huge movement where people are like chickenpox. Why do we vaccinate for chickenpox? I had it when I was young, I was fine. But we forget that, you know, some children go to the hospital because of chickenpox. Now, I got, I got an overwhelmingly positive re uh, response from the scientific community and the medical community. People, were, they, they just like erupted into a huge cheer. Um, and I was pretty happy with that. But to be honest, that's not my target audience. Not that I don't care about these guys, but that's not who I talk to. I talk to the public. And the response from the public was actually pretty awesome too. It was really, really good. And basically what people told me, and that was really a, a defining moment for, for me on my website, is people said, you know what I like about your comic and your whole website is that it's not condescending. You know, it's actually, you're using my intelligence. You, 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 you talk to me like I'm an intelligent person who's able to make an informed decision if I'm provided the right information, you know? Uh, you're not just giving me orders and telling me do this or this or that. And that's, that's really the best compliment I can get when someone says that to me. Like, I don't treat them like they're treated most of the time. Now, obviously, I did not get only positive comments. Um, I mean, people against vaccines can be pretty vocal, uh, pretty aggressive, especially online. I'm sure you already know about that. So I heard it all, right? Vaccines are crap. Uh, I'll be dead before anyone vaccinates my child, which is the emotional version of that. Uh, everybody has a right to their opinion, which is weird because I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree with that statement, but I, 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 I still don't see the link with vaccines, though. Um, vaccines are how the U.S. government introduced AIDS in Africa. Can you believe it? I, I still can't believe that people think those things. It's horrible, really. But there's tons of conspiracy theories out there. Now, these were the worst, right? There's some others that are not that, that bad. Like, vaccines do more harm than they do good. Fair enough. I'm perfectly open to that idea. As long as you have some data to back that up, you don't. Okay, well, let's go to the next then. Vaccines cause autism and other serious diseases. Again, the trap, the trap here would be to say, no, vaccines do not cause serious diseases. That's impossible. And I hear that. I hear some doctors or some pharmacists saying that before. And see, I don't get that, because what will happen in five years from now, and let's say we discover that some specific vaccine caused some specific serious disease, that's very much possible, right? But the thing is, if, if that happens, then we'll change our approach. We'll just change our recommendations, 
because that's what scientists do. We're not like stuck in a dogma. We're people who follow the evidence where it leads them. And I really like to, to, to say that very often to people because people kind of think that scientists, they're just stuck on one idea and it's completely inaccurate. I think we're the most flexible people in the world, actually. Um, I don't know if you heard of that before. Paul Graham is a, is a computer engineer and he's actually a, a brilliant atheist from the United States and he writes about all these different topics and that's, that's my favorite invention of his. He, he invented this hierarchy of disagreement uh, I guess he was tired of people disagreeing with him online uh, or even in his daily life and people coming with, you know, like useless arguments, really. So it just classified the different uh, arguments and it starts with the worst, which is name calling. So like the argument would be, well, you know what? You're an idiot. That's an argument. It's just a very bad one. And the, the best one would be refutation. Refutation would be, well, here, what you say here is inaccurate, and here is why it's inaccurate, and I do have some arguments of my own or some piece of data that I can use to refute what you're saying. So these two parts here are pretty awesome. You know, it's the interesting part of the discussion. But what I realized in my, you know, with the huge amount of comment that I got uh, through my interventions in the media and also in my, per in my practice as a pharmacist, we, ne we very, very rarely get there. We never get to the interesting part of the discussion. And again, we're all scientists in the room tonight, and I think that's what interests us. We like to play with data and uh, oppose some data with some other piece of data, and that's, well, I find that exciting. I don't know about you guys, but that's what I like. But we're really stuck there. We're really stuck in the part where it's not really meaningful. Like the best I've seen is counter argument where people say, well, I found this online, this uh, piece of data, and just, there you go, deal with that now. Uh, all right, so am I supposed to figure it out for myself? Or are you actually going to refute some of the things I say? No, they, they don't go up there. So it's kind of sad. And that's led me to realize something that uh, I'm, not, I'm not proud of this discovery, but the debate about vaccines, debate, it's not a rational one. It's really an emotional one when you think about that. And again, we're really rational people. We like to deal with facts and data. But that's not how people think. That's not how the public thinks. Um, here's what people against vaccines say. They say things like, do you have children? Yes. Do you love? Do you love your child? Yes, of course. Now, how would you feel if your child died because you accepted that they get a vaccine? Would you feel ashamed? Would you, be, would you feel guilty that you're responsible for your child's death? Wow, I mean, that's powerful stuff, right? But that's no, I mean, there's no data, there's no facts in there. It's 100% emotional, and it's not only emotional, it's actually very negative ideas. So that's what we're against a lot of the time. So, I mean, it saddens me to say that, but the, the whole, I mean, the issues and the, the whole debate about vaccines, it cannot be won only with rational ideas has to be won also on an emotional level. And that's what I try to do to some extent. Now, when I hear that, I'm not sure if I should get vaccinated or not. I like that. I'm fine with that because, you know, when people show that they have doubts about anything related to science and health, I see that as a sign of intelligence. And I, I'm, if, if, we, if we take these people and we say, well, do you hesitate? Then, you know, you're wrong. That's where we take the wrong path. That's, where, that's when people go and just leave and stop believing in us and stop trusting us. So when you hear that, you need to say, well, you know what? You're completely correct to have doubts. And I, I completely understand that. And now I'm going to tell you some things in order to, um, so yeah, that you can make a better, a better decision or an informed decision. That's what we should do. And not saying to people, do this or this or think this or this. Now, refusal for me, refusal of vaccines is, I, I see that in a completely different way. You know, for me, it's a different problem. Like, uh, refusal, from my personal experience, it's part of a bigger set of beliefs. Um, you know, people, we get that a lot in Canada, and I don't know how it is, and you can tell me after, after that how it is in your own countries, but we have this movement where people kind of reject modern medicine. And they think that doctors are wrong and they know better than their doctor. 
And it's kind of, well, it's kind of annoying, first of all, but it's kind of, uh, it's, uh, kind of scary at the same time that everybody's an expert now. And I, I do think that refusal is part of a bigger set of beliefs because vaccine is just one tiny part of the, of, of the thing that they believe. Like, these people sometimes come up with ideas like, well, your body is full of toxins and uh, you need to detox and to, you need to clean out your liver so that it will function better, which I don't I have no idea what that means. Um, and also milk. They say things like milk is a deadly poison. Now, if milk, if cow's milk is a deadly poison, it has to be the most ineffective poison ever invented, right? <laughs> I mean, what about a poison that kills you over a lifetime? It's, I mean, it's not a good idea at all. Not a good strategy from the milk killers or whatever. <laughs> all right. And another part of this whole set of ideas, uh, and I actually, I, I, can, I can relate to that very easily, is the idea that, that the pharmaceutical industry is, is evil, basically. Uh, you know, that the, pharma, that the pharma companies just want to make huge amounts of profits and then, you know, take the money and run, <laughs> basically. Uh, and, I mean, we know it's inaccurate, but a lot of people think that. They think that the pharmaceutical industry just wants your money and they don't care about public health. So, I mean, we need to do something about that, right? All right. So, some lessons that I learned. I, I, I've, I've said a lot of things. And I, I talk fast, right? So, I, I, I've said a lot of things. But what, what's the lessons that I learned throughout all of this? The first thing is healthcare professionals we need to spend more time uh, focusing on influencing behavior. Because when you think about that, what's, what's a doctor? What's a, what's a physician, a pharmacist, a nurse? We're influencers, really. We're people trying to get other people to change something significant in their own lives. That's, I mean, that's major when you think about that. And making changes, and I mean, just making changes in my own life is difficult. So convincing someone else to do it is even tougher. And I think we spend a lot of time, you know, perfecting our knowledge of medicine, medications, uh, you know, uh, diseases. But we spend almost no time working on our influencing skills and our communication skills. Uh, does anybody in the room know what the Prochaska is? Prochaska method? Yeah, I see some nodding heads. I've started using that a few years ago. It's, it's, it's an approach, it's a method used in, uh, in healthcare, it's used in business, and it's basically just recognizing that people go through certain steps before they change a behavior in their life. And I've, I've, I've had huge success. Like, the impact I have with my patients when I talk to them one-to-one, -one, it's, it's so different now that I'm using that. And I think we should work a lot more on that as healthcare professionals. Yeah, right. I've, I've mentioned that before. Huh? People are dramatically unmoved by data. Data puts them to sleep. So let's stop with all this data, please, people. Uh, what gets people interested, if not data? Well, lots of things. People respond to emotions. Again, if you can connect emotionally with someone, then you kind of get their permission to then inform them of some things about some tidbits of facts and data, and that's a very powerful medium. Uh, using their language, I get criticized, not very, not a lot, but sometimes people say that I take too much freedom with the French language uh, on my website, and it's true. Uh, I write like people talk, which means that sometimes I use English words, sometimes I invent words that are not even in the dictionary, uh, sometimes I also use some swear words when it's appropriate to do it, but that's why it works. It works because people, they go online and they don't want to read this huge, like 5,000 word text written in a very formal language, very scientific way. They want to read something that somehow resembles them and so that some, something they can connect with. So that's why I'm doing that. I'm using their language so that they feel connected. It's just a way of engaging people. Stuff they can use. This is a very tough one. Because a lot of the things we try to tell people about, they're very theoretical. For us, they have a lot of sense, but for a lot of people, they make no sense at all. So we always have to find something that makes a difference in their daily life. It has to apply, it has to have an, a practical application in their daily life. And that's, I, I challenge myself to do that. 
uh, when I create a comic, when I make an intervention on TV, uh, when I work, when I give an advice to a patient at a pharmacy, I ask myself, how can I make this not theoretical but actually practical? How can it have an impact on their daily life? Not easy to do, but when you can manage to do that, it makes a whole world of difference. And finally, authenticity and humility. And I've mentioned that before, but what, what, why do we need this is really to bridge the gap between scientists and healthcare professionals and the public. Because the public, they see us like, like superheroes, <laughs> basically. And people don't like superheroes. Well, they like them in like Hollywood movies and uh, comic books. But they don't want to deal with superheroes on a personal level. Uh, you know, the, the, the people see the side of us that's at work, like in, you work in research labs, you work in hospitals and clinics and universities, and people see the side of us that's like, bring it on, you know, always ready to tackle all of these problems. But people need to see the other side. They need to see the, the human side, the normal side, um, the even fragile side. And that's why I tell all these personal stories on my website. It's not because I'm a, I'm a voyeur or whatever, or I like people you know, <laughs> listening about all my personal life. It's really because I want them to see not only the pharmacist, but also the guy, the regular guy, because they won't connect with the pharmacist, but they will connect with the normal guy. And if they can connect with the normal guy, then they'll be ready to listen to the pharmacist, see? Here's, a, here's an interesting one. I think uh, if you guys don't know about that, you'll find that pretty funny. Uh, that's a campaign about the HPV vaccine that ran in Quebec in 2011. And when it came out, that was, I thought that was pretty funny. Um, what it said basically was very simple. It said, if you don't want to get HPV, you go, oh, sorry about that. It kind of, it, it advances automatically, but I just ruined my punch. That's okay. You didn't, you didn't see it, right? Oh, thank you so much for saying that. Um, so you have two options if you don't want to get HPV. The first one is to get the vaccine, and the second one is to wear a chastity belt. Now, when I first saw that, I was like, well, that's pretty funny. But then I thought about that a bit more, and you know what? There's something that's kind of condescending in there. Because when you think about that, nobody's going to wear a chastity belt. I mean, nobody's going to do that. So then there's only one option. The only option is getting the vaccine. So what we're actually saying in that campaign is, look, if you don't want to get HPV, you have no choice, is get the vaccine now, listen to me, do what I say. And that's the problem, that's the problem. When we tell people what to do, they disconnect, okay? I know it's hard for us, it's hard for us scientists and healthcare professionals because we know our stuff so much, it's easy to fall into this trap of telling people what to do, but telling people doesn't work. We need to trust their intelligence and believe that they can make an informed decision if we empower them. We need to empower them into making those decisions. Not always easy. I think this campaign, they had a good idea. I mean, I like the funny <laughs> idea behind it, but it needs improvement, let's be honest. Uh, media scrutiny, um, we hear lots of things in the media and uh, th just this one, I don't know if you, any of you read about that. I think it was two or three weeks ago. Uh, it came from CNN iReport, which is kind of the CNN written by anyone, written by like uh, amateurs, uh, journalists, basically. And there was this article that was called Fraud at the CDC Uncovered, 340% risk of autism hidden from the public. And look at the number of shares on that, 204 thousand shares, not, not likes. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Facebook jargon, but that means that a few dozen million people actually read that. Now, the article was not that bad, but look at the title, how, I mean, it's misleading. It's completely misleading. It's one of the worst titles I've seen in the last few years. And the sad thing is that after that happened, there were a few scientists like myself we wrote on that on our own websites, on our Facebook page, and we told people, look, let's put that into perspective and blah, blah, blah. But the damage is already done because there's already too many people who saw that and not a lot of people are going to see our own websites. So when that happens, we need to tell, we need to tell the media. And us in the room, I think we're in the best position to do that because we're, well, I'm, no, I'm, not the, I'm not an expert, but you guys are experts on that. 
it's our responsibility to tell the media when they do stuff like that because they don't know better and they'll keep doing it. And the damage can very rarely be undone, unfortunately. Trust in the pharma industry is a tough one. Uh, it's, it's really a tough one, but it's, it's mandatory. We gotta address that because how can you get people to trust vaccines when they don't trust the companies making them? It makes no sense whatsoever. So we need to do something about that and it needs to come from the leaders of the industry. I've worked in the industry, I still, I do some consulting for pharmaceutical companies for, to do exactly that, I, 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 I help them, um, you know, just uh, getting the, the idea uh, inside their own company. Because I can see some people, like I, met, I meet people from sales and marketing and sometimes they say that, they say, yeah, our goal is to improve public health and make great medications and profits is not that important. But then again, I care about my bonus at the end of the year and that's what matters at the end of the day, you know? So how, again, how, how can you make people believe it if you don't actually believe it yourself? So I think there's something that needs to be done. I think the leaders need to come forward and say, look, the culture inside my, com well, our company is we make great medications to improve people's health. And if we do that, then it's for sure, eventually we'll get some profit out of that. And we have to repeat it, repeat it, repeat it over so that people will not only say it, but they'll believe it and they'll act upon it. And finally, vaccination acceptance. I mean, I, I, I think I've made it pretty clear that in my opinion, we're not going to win the whole fight or the whole battle with just data. We need to find why people hesitate, why people refuse. It's really all about what's going on in people's minds, you know? So we can have some data to prove that yes, vaccines are safe, they're effective, but it's not gonna change what the public thinks about vaccines. So it's not only, I think it's not only legitimate, but it's actually a critical field of study when you think about that. And I'm, I'm actually so happy because I didn't even know that a meeting like that existed before I was invited here. And I think it's awesome that we can get together and find work on that, you know, find the reasons why people think this or that way, and we can make some recommendation and act upon that. I think that's amazing. That's it for me. Uh, quick thank yous to everyone in the room for attending, first of all. Uh, thank you to, you for the, to the organizing committee, my God. Thank you so much for inviting me. I still can't believe I'm on stage in Europe right now. I should be home on my couch right now, I guess. I don't know what time it is, though. Might be at work. And thank you to people who visit my website because there has to be like one or two people somewhere who know about me, you know? Because, uh, yeah, sorry? The other one? Yeah, that's, yeah that's, my, that's my personal address if you want to write me. But thank you so much for anyone who's uh, inviting me here. And there has to be some one or two people at the foundation who uh, know what I do and appreciate that. And that makes a world of difference to me. Uh, and uh, that got me a keynote speech, uh, so how about that? So thank you so much.